What do you, what do you, say, to, what do you say to people back home who may not follow this that closely, but just expect you guys to get this very basic function of your job done and fund the government? We're dysfunctional. It's just that simple. That simple. We are that. We are so dysfunctional. Uh, you know, we've got we've got nobody at the head. Republican Tim Burchett of Tennessee with a candid assessment of Congress and what is happening or not happening on Capitol Hill. It comes as House Speaker Kevin McCarthy will again try to pass a defense spending measure, a measure that typically passes very easily after far-right members blocked it from moving forward. Meanwhile, the Senate finally confirmed a top military officer yesterday, an Air Force general that President Joe Biden not Nominated for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff four months ago. One getting through. We'll show you what Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville had to say about his blockade that's preventing hundreds of promotions because that still stands. Also on Capitol Hill today, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky will meet with House and Senate leaders, hoping to secure more military aid in the fight against Russian forces. You know, Willie, the, the thing I would disagree with the congressman is he says we've got nobody at the head as far as the Republicans. They certainly do. Uh, they just have a lot of crazy people behind it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they're six, seven, ten, fifteen people, and we knew this from the very beginning. They're just gesturing. They just want to raise hell. They don't want to get anything done. They don't want to get the, their business done. Because, again, I just, had, just so people understand, this is about money. It's about yeah. economics. It's not about balancing the budget. We, we've been through it. Republicans don't care about balancing the budget. And they haven't for the past 20 years, especially when Republicans are in the White House. Donald Trump spent more money with this Congress than any president and any Congress in the history of the Republic. But now it's about making money. So they can raise hell. They go, oh, crazy. They get on TV. They go wild saying, oh, Kevin McCarthy's not a real conservative. And they raise money. Yeah. That's all it's about. They want to go online. They can send out, uh, you know, fundraising emails, they can tweet, they can do all this. It's all gesture and it's all crazy Republicans. And who are the people who lose because of this other than their constituents? These Republicans that actually won in Joe Biden's seats, they're the ones that are going to lose in 2024 if this and, continues. And that's why we're hearing a lot of those moderates. We're going to have Congressman Lawler of New York um, upstate a little yeah. bit from here on. He's in a swing district, a very close race that he won. He's speaking out. And you, you don't hear typically Republicans coming out to the press, coming out of these caucus meetings and saying effectively, we're terrible right now. We're a mess. Usually it's yeah. Democrats yeah. describing yeah. Republicans, but you're hearing that from Republicans saying that this is a disaster and it's not clear what Kevin McCarthy does to get out of it. It looks like he caved a little bit to that minority you talked about who, yes, are trying to get fundraising or trying to get podcast audience, stay famous, stay relevant. That's what they're doing here. He's not it's not clear how he finds his way out of this and more importantly how we fund the government because the shutdown is a week from saturday by my count that's nine days from now without a clear path out of it no street journal editorial page here jonathan mm. lemire i heard you talking right about it a second ago but donald trump afraid afraid to debate definitely and the wall street journal says asks a question lead uh lead editorial why is donald trump afraid to debate and uh and and they go through a series a series of uh, of things but the bottom line is they they conclude by saying mr trump's advisors may be telling him he shouldn't appear unless he says something that hurts his legal defense which of course he does all the but that's a sign of weakness not strength and he'll have to answer those questions eventually what is the former president afraid of asks the wall street journal editorial page yeah, it's the right question. And obviously, it does a disservice to voters, Republican voters, to our democracy if he doesn't participate in these debates. He should, period, full stop. But right now, they're sending no signal that he will. He skipped the first debate. He showed no slippage in the polls. In fact, his lead 
has only grown. Uh, he is not going to participate next week in per parts because of a personal animosity he has against the Ronald Reagan Library of all places. But now he's sending signals that he won't go to the third one, which is scheduled a month later. And some of his aides have raised the possibility, why do it at all? They feel like if he, sh if he shows up, all he does is elevate those around him. He becomes subject to their attacks. They feel like he could get pulled to the right on certain issues, trying to out conservative someone like a Mike Pence or a Governor DeSantis or whoever it might be. There remains the Chris Christie factor where they're afraid of, of perhaps of, of Christie going at him one on one, which is Christie is telegraphed saying that's what he's born to do at this moment. Uh, and we also should raise the possibility of Trump, were he to be the nominee, not participating in general election debates either. Remember last, what, what drama was around at four years ago. So none of this is good for the democracy, full stop. But also, it's not good you know, for these other candidates who try to take a swipe at him. And it does seem like Donald Trump, maybe it's an effort to not say something incriminating, although he does that anyway, uh, it doesn't seem like he's going to participate. He, he feels like he can do a glide path to the nomination and start thinking about a general election stance with issues like abortion and visiting those auto workers next week. Well, not only that, the Wall Street Journal suggests, uh, I mean, and if you look at what happened last weekend, Willie, where you looked at him, he just got lost. He just blanked. And he couldn't even remember one, who he was running against in 2024. And then, and I know it was almost eight years ago. It was a long time ago. If you're, if you're, you know, we've all been around people with dementia, people getting older, people forgetting things. Or just not knowing history. Well, no, it's his history. So if, 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 if his mind wasn't jumbled at that moment, he would remember that he ran against Hillary Clinton in 2016. But he couldn't remember who he ran against in 2016, so he just slid Obama in there. And he couldn't sure. remember who he's running against in 2024. So what he did... He just slid Obama's name in there. <laughs> it's just kind of a catch-all. So I guess if you start your career with a racist conspiracy theory about Obama, he's got that back there somewhere. So he's living somewhere in 2011. So he's, I'll just say Obama's name. People seem to like that. But the Wall Street Journal editorial page actually suggests about as much that maybe he's afraid he's just too old to do this. They, they write... Why is Mr. Trump afraid to confront other Republicans without the aid of a teleprompter? Is he worried he'd look his age at 77 next to younger candidates? And you know what? I know for Donald, that line hurts because He's seen the video of how addled he looked and how confused he looked and how shaken he looked last weekend when he couldn't even remember who he was running against. And now you've got the Wall Street Journal editorial page saying, hey, what? I guess this guy's, you know, he's afraid he can't do this without a teleprompter and he's too old, which I guess starts raising questions, Willie. Like, is this really who the Republicans, if 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 they if they don't look at the four indictments and the stealing of the nuclear secrets and the stealing of war plans and the attempt to steal an election, like maybe the Wall Street Journal is suggesting, and I think they are, hey, there's a reason why Donald Trump is afraid to debate. Is it because he's afraid he's getting too old and he may lose his mind like he did that night on stage when he thought he was running against Barack Obama. I mean, if you're debating somebody and you don't even know who you're running against in the general election, that could cause a problem. I'm not good at this politics <laughs> thing, but that could cause a problem. I think just throwing Obama out as a stand-in for all Democrats, I think that works. You know, it's hard to remember yeah. all the names of all the people you've run against. So many of them. Over, over the course of your career. Um, yeah, it's one thing to stand at a rally with a friendly crowd and to play the greatest hits, to get all the cheers, to have the music play you off the stage. It's another thing to stand on the stage 
and be under attack, although I guess it's an open question whether this field even would attack Donald Trump, given the reverence they've shown for him. But to be on a stage, on your feet, having to react and to answer criticism, to answer substantive questions from a moderator, that's probably not the best format for him. And as John says, he's looking at the polling, even inside places like Iowa, where he lost last time, and he's up by 25, 28, 30 points. New Hampshire and, of course, the national polls that show him up 50 points. And if you're playing with that big a lead, why would you mess with that? So it sounds like maybe yeah. the Wall Street Journal is trying to bait Donald Trump into I don't getting know. to one of the debates with the age question. But if you're advising uh. Donald Trump and you're up by 50, why risk it? Yeah. I mean, you know, and but I guess you just say, I mean, these are perilous times we're living through, Mika. I mean, if you ask Donald Trump. We keep going in this direction. We may start World War II. Okay. Which, by the way, I'm glad Caddy's here. We yeah. can warn her family that. just to be prepared. Caddy Kay might need to know about that. Yeah. John Paul Mary's here yeah. as well. And new reporting suggests he might help himself just a tiny bit by doing that because Donald Trump is spending a lot of time thinking about the possibility of going to prison, despite what he said on Meet the Press. When you go to bed at night, do you worry about going to jail? No, I don't, really. I don't even think about it. I'm built a little differently, I guess, because I have had people come up to me and say, how do you do it, sir? How do you do it? Uh, I don't even think about it. Uh, these are corrupt people that I'm dealing with. They're destroying our country. I don't even think about it. All I think about is making the country great, making America great. I mean, I've got the question, how do you do it? How do you do it, sir? But I'm talking about the hair. Did you see that hair? I, well, I can't talk today, but yeah. I I'm shallow, it. but <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, how do you do it, sir? Uh, what person walks up to him, sir? Everybody goes, sir? Listen, there's not <laughs> How do you get the hair to do that? It's going in just a variety of directions. It's like a Medusa <laughs> thing there. I don't know. I would ask him if I saw him. Had a Donald, how do you do it, sir? I just don't do you know, know what there is to get out of a Donald Trump nervous. conversation at this well, point. Well, I got to see the hair. Because he lies so much. Get the hair. It's just like, got to do a full he stop a at the lies. You, you know, inside the line, though, there's always an admission that's going to send him to jail for even more years. So, I mean, he, and, and this time, the admission was, no, I don't, I, you know, I, I didn't take... No, I know people have said that I took, I, advice. I took advice from lawyers, and so is that not? Can you not do that anymore? That's what people used to say about Donald Trump. But Donald Trump, of course, got rid of that defense by not, not oh, no, I didn't rely on the advice of counsel. I thought about overthrowing the federal government all by myself. Yep. Again, this way. His lawyers don't want him to I turn to my brain. Yeah. All right. However, three sources familiar with uh, Trump's comments tell Rolling Stone that the former president has been hammering his attorneys with questions over the past several months about what prison could look like for him. They include, would he have to wear one of those jumpsuits? Would he be sent to a bad prison? And would he serve out a sentence in a plush home confinement situation? Those questions are in direct contrast with Trump's public comments regarding his legal problems. Trump faces 91 felony counts. 91. 91, that's a lot. I keep this in mind. In four different cases, he has pleaded not guilty to all the charges against him. And I, I say that 91, 91 thing with emphasis because I think about Republicans on Capitol Hill, yeah. Hill who, mm -hmm. who have fallen so far away from their core Republican values. Yeah. And for what? For a four-time indicted rapist? Well... Not rapist. The, the the judge the judge a judge says rapist? judge says that that what he did what well, the jury found him liable for was what what everybody else defines as rape. So four time indicted, uh, found liable of sexual abuse, but the judge calls it rapist. Yes, that's okay. It doesn't flow right off, you know, right right out. But yes, that, but watch the deposition it. in that case also, and see how he treats the attorney. This is a misogynist. Stealing, this is a disgusting man. Well, stealing nuclear secrets. There's and, that, and but people don't care about that. But I wonder plans. if you would care they about your care. children acting no. that way. I no, mean, they don't. what gets no. to Christians in America who? People who call themselves Christians, you mean? I was just thinking <laughs> that perhaps appealing to what they want for their children no, might break they through. They don't care because what they're doing is they're putting him up as oh. the example for their children. So their words mean 
Yeah. A man who would have sex with a porn star, use campaign finance money for it, lie about it, then admit it's true, then treat uh, the attorney of another woman who claims he raped her in a dressing room and he's found liable of sexual assault of that woman and defamation. Then he defames her again. Then she goes back to court and he's found uh, liable of defaming her again. I mean, do you want your children to act this way? Yes, they do. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, they do. Uh, they, they're part of the cult. They I are part of I mean, so, so, and the funny it. thing is at the same time, so many of these people will go out and judge other people, right? For doing one thousandth of that in their lives. These people will hold up this guy as some like latter day prophet. It is, I guess the kids would call it bizarre, really screwed up. I would use another word, but it's early. This is a kid show. Really early. That's why we have the Cuckoo <laughs> Fran and Ollie cartoons in between breaks. Kid, a lot of kids tune in and watch yeah, like this them. show. But, but you know, Jen, here's the reason why Donald Trump, and we know, by the way, I mean, we, we, we know, we've known for a very long time, this guy isn't going around going, oh, I'm built a different way. I don't want, he worries. He worries. He's not sitting around there. He frets. He is the most insecure guy on the face of the earth behind that facade. And he has to know what even his fiercest defenders on Fox News say, like Jonathan Turley. 91 counts. And if he goes 90 and 1, he's going to jail for the rest of his life. 90 and 1. He could win 90 and lose 1. Every one of those counts, basically... At Donald Trump's age, well, that equals a life sentence. So, so yeah, the guy's worried, and I can see why. If I were, if I were carrying that around, or you, or any other body, I mean, we would forget what decade we were living in too. Just like Donald Trump would be going around. You know, did you get your grocery list? Yeah, uh, yeah, Obama gave it to me. Uh, you going to be, watch your kid play tonight? Yeah, yeah, he plays with Obama. I mean, we'd be throwing people's name around. 91 Cheer. counts. Every one of them is a life sentence. The guy, obviously, is crack. I think, he, I think he's losing it, which is why the last thing he wants to do, the last thing his lawyers want him to do is go out and debate because... He may give admissions, and his political people don't want him to lose his mind on stage like he did last Saturday. The uh, facade is the right word, right? Because that's why you have that's that 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 it's why this facade of the strong man exists is because of the insecurities behind it. And the um, what I find so interesting about the the Wall Street Journal uh, editorial. I mean, they really threw, like, all the bait out there, right? Like, maybe he's old. I don't know. Maybe he's scared. I don't know. Maybe that's it. Uh, to, you know, try to prey on his on his ego to try to get him to do this. Um, and, I mean, with the things that he's scared about in the Rolling Stone interview, the, the jumpsuit is just, yeah. like, you know, just <laughs> like the ideation of what may be, of what may be coming. But... Uh, Republican voters are allowing all this all to happen. They don't seem to care that he's not willing to debate. And, you know, they seem to be willing to um, back him anyway. I mean, you see when he does come up against reporters uh, in the, you know, in the Welker interview, he does get himself tripped up. He does get at, he, he doesn't seem to be able to um, uh, he, he's not able to volley these questions effectively. So you can see why they're not wanting to do that. Plus the legal concerns. Yeah, they also love the question, will it be one of the bad prisons? <laughs> there, are, Mr. <laughs> there are no good prisons, uh, yeah. no Mr. Good Prince, Mr. President. There are yeah. no good ones. Yeah. Today, the leader of the war-torn country will take his message to Washington to meet with President Joe Biden and members of Congress. Let's bring in United States Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. Also joining the table, NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent and host of Andrea Mitchell Reports. Andrea Mitchell is with us as well. Mr. Secretary, great to have you with us. Um, so where do we stand right now in terms of Washington supporting Kiev? Uh, do you think you still have enough Republicans in the House and Senate uh, to, to, to keep this country united uh, in its pushback against Vladimir Putin's illegal invasion? Joe, first, great to see you. Mika, great to see you. Um, and, and really great to be here this morning. 
Look, the hallmark of uh, this effort to support Ukraine has been bipartisan support, and we've seen that from day one. Conversations I've had with leaders in Congress, including uh, Republican leaders in, in recent days, shows that, that that support remains strong. And I think as President Zelensky has an opportunity to, to come to Washington to make his case directly to, uh, to folks in Congress, I think you'll see that uh, support continue to be manifested. And it is so vital that we continue to back the Ukrainians the way we have. And by the way, not just us. We have dozens of other countries doing the same thing. Um, the stakes are extraordinarily high. You know, we're here in New York at the United Nations, and this place came together. I mean, we tend to forget it because it's so long ago. This place came together after two world wars. And the basic idea was countries need to come together, agree on certain rules, how they're going to operate and how they're going to relate to each other to make sure we don't have another world war. And a big part of that was saying, and it's right there in the UN Charter, that you've got to respect another country's sovereignty. It's territorial integrity. You can't just go in, cross its borders, bully the country, try to take it over, erase it from the map. Exactly what Putin has tried to do and failed to do in Ukraine. If we allow that to go forward with impunity, if we allow Putin to get away with it, then it is open season for any would-be aggressor anywhere in the world. They're all watching, and they're saying, if he can do it, I can do it. That's a world full of conflict. That's a world full of hurt. It's a world we don't want to be in. So I think the stakes are clear. The interest is clear. And then, of course, there's a profound human dimension that I know touches lots of Americans. And that was just the first point, the point about the U.N. Charter and sovereignty that you made in your case before mm. the Security Council yesterday. You added that Russia is committing war crimes, engaging in nuclear saber rattling, weaponizing hunger, now cooperating with North Korea mm. in, in the war effort. It's a case you've made many times over the last year and a half. Is it your sense that the, the people who need to hear that message are internalizing it? Are they willing to do anything about it? Well, I think it's really important that we keep coming back, not just to the the strong interest that we have in supporting Ukraine with all these other countries, but also the human dimension, because it's, it's easy from so far away uh, or in a conference room uh, to lose sight of that. You're, we're talking big policy issues. I was just in Ukraine for the fourth time since the Russian aggression, and Andrea has been there so many times as well. You know, we, um, we went to a small town, Yehidni. It's uh, about two and a half hours drive outside of Kyiv, and went there. And when the Russians came in 18 months ago, they took over this town. They herded up all of the residents, just a few hundred people. They took them to the schoolhouse. They put them in a basement, a basement unfit for human habitation. They had their command post on the, on the ground floor, and they basically put people there as human shields. And it was elderly people, it was women, it was children as young as a month old. They kept them there for 28 days in a room uh, not any bigger than this set. No air. Uh, no sanitation. Uh, and what happened during those 28 days is truly horrific. I, had, uh, I, I saw this room, uh, people who had been there. They showed me on the wall a list that they kept, a list that they kept of local residents who had been executed by the Russian invaders, and then a list of people who were in that room and who had died in that room, including about 10 people, mostly elderly. If they died after noon, the Russians would not allow the removal of the body. So you had children in that room as young as a couple of months old, but three, four, five, six years old, forced to be there with barely no room to, to lie down, uh, to be there with those bodies. 28 days until the Ukrainians came back. Now, this is one small town in one place in Ukraine. And what we're seeing in different ways uh, over these 18 months are these kinds of abuses and atrocities being committed. We can't lose sight of that either. So when you tell that story, Mr. Secretary, to your counterpart from Beijing or your counterparts from India who might actually be in a position to lean on Vladimir Putin, to have a little bit of leverage but haven't done so, what do they say? Why aren't they doing more? So first, do no harm. What we want to make sure of is that uh, countries that may have some affinities with Russia don't go in there and support Russia right. with material support, with arms, with weapons. But we're also seeing something else. Over the last few months, the Ukrainians have been pushing their own uh, peace proposal. Uh, and we've had a couple of meetings where we brought countries together uh, from around the world, including countries like Brazil, like India, like South Africa, like China, all coming together to talk about the Ukrainian plan for peace. And that's progress, because if all of these countries rally behind those basic ideas, then I think we can eventually see some movement. The problem now is this. In this moment, Vladimir Putin has shown no interest in actually coming uh, up with a meaningful um, diplomatic settlement. 
Mr. Secretary, I was at an event last night where uh, President Zelensky was awarded and gave a speech, and it's so compelling in person. Hmm. Are you counting on him in person to Congress because a new letter today has enough House and Senate members to block the aid, hmm. and they're still saying they're, they're going to refuse? I think we all know, we've all heard him many times, um, President Zelensky is incredibly compelling. He's a terrific communicator. But that communication is, comes from someplace deep and real. And ultimately, and I keep coming back to this because I've seen, talked to so many Ukrainians over the last eight, 18 months, the real difference maker when it comes to success is the fact that they're fighting for their own country, for their own future, for their own lives. The Russians are not uh, in the same way. And I think that makes the biggest difference. And let's keep this in perspective, too. Just over the last year, um, the Ukrainians have taken back more than 50 percent of the territory that had been seized from them by Putin starting in February 2022. Now, the last few months in this counteroffensive, it's been tough. It's been hard going, but they're making progress there, too. This is not the time uh, to give up on them. But the, uh, there's one last thing that's important here. We're also working to make sure that we can transition to the kind of sustainable long term support that we and, and other countries uh, can really get behind. And that means basically getting to a point where Ukraine is standing on its own two feet, militarily, economically, democratically. And we've got 30 countries working on that right now. Mr. Secretary, there seems to be kind of two conversations happening in New York this week with uh, the conversation we're having around the table at the moment, which mm. is about Ukraine, but a lot of countries from what you might call the global south saying, hold on a second, this is a priority that is led by America and European countries, but we're actually much more focused on issues like climate change mm. and the inequity around climate change and the degree to which we're suffering. How much are you trying to reach out to those countries, not just on Ukraine, but say, listen, we do hear you and the expansion of the BRICS, the G20, we, mm. they have a sort of sense of momentum about them and a feeling that perhaps America is ignoring their agendas. So, Cuddy, I think if you had an opportunity to listen to the president speak to this, to the General Assembly, two thirds, three quarters of his speech was exactly on those issues, the issues directly of concern to people around the globe. And he made the case that um, we need uh, as an international community to focus on them. He made the case that the United States is by far the leading contributor to all of these efforts, whether it's on climate whether it's on food security, whether it's on building better infrastructure and building it uh, in the right way, whether it's dealing with global health, all of the issues that people care about uh, around the world, we are the number one provider. And it's a false choice to say it's either Ukraine or it's this global agenda. We have to do both. And in fact, we are doing both. And I think what I heard after the president spoke, just talking to a lot of my counterparts from around the world, was deep appreciation for the focus that he brought to these issues and appreciation for the fact that the United States is leading on them. Mr. Secretary, you mentioned a few moments ago the Ukrainian peace proposal. Mm. Uh, could you give us the details of the Ukrainian peace proposal? Mm. And this is a peace proposal made by the heads of a government of a nation that has been destroyed. Mm. It's been destroyed. It's going to cost billions and decades to recover. Mm. What's going on? So, Mike, two things here. First, the, the proposal is grounded in the basic principles of the United Nations Charter, starting with territorial integrity, starting with sovereignty, uh, but also looking at uh, elements that would help the Ukrainians rebuild the country that's been devastated uh, by the Russians uh, and find other accommodations. It's a very strong foundation for uh, starting a, a negotiation. But the recovery of Ukraine is usually important because as much as the military support matters, uh, the flip side of that is for the country not just to survive, but to thrive, it has to have a strong economic recovery and it has to deep root its democracy. So one of the things we did just this week is the, the president named uh, a, a close colleague of mine, former Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker, who uh, is deeply connected to the private sector, deep government experience, to lead our own efforts on helping uh, Ukraine pursue its economic recovery. I, as I look at it, as we look at it, we see tremendous opportunity for private sector investment in Ukraine. Governments can do a lot. They have done a lot. International banks have done a lot, will continue to do a lot, but ultimately the secret to success is making sure Ukraine has a really strong and positive investment environment and that companies go there. We met with a, a number of leading American companies just yesterday here in New York, and I think there's a real enthusiasm for working in Ukraine. That is the, the, the secret to Ukraine's long-term success. Strong military, strong economy, strong democracy. Mr. Secretary, I want to ask you about the Middle East because Prime Minister Netanyahu said to the President, to President Biden yesterday, that they could make history together. And mm. I'm told that this deal is really 
really coming together. It's going to be very difficult. It's complicated. But it's a three-way deal where Israel will give up some land to the Palestinians, yet undefined. Saudi Arabia would get civilian nuclear power ability from the U.S., which has long been, you know, a red line for a lot of people, especially in Congress. And Saudi Arabia would recognize Israel, which would be a tectonic shift, which could end the Arab-Israeli conflict and a lot of other, you know, side deals, plus this defense agreement between the mm -hmm. United States and Saudi Arabia, which would be the first for the Middle East. Now, hard to come together, but that is history being made. Uh, do you think that this could actually happen, maybe in the new year? Well, Andrews, you've laid out very well. There are a lot of moving pieces here. Um, but the point you made, that this would be transformative, is exactly right. We've had decades of instability, disruption, conflict in the Middle East, go back, go back to 1979 or even before. Mm. To move to a region that's more and more integrated, where countries have a stake in, in working together and keeping the peace, and of course the strong message that it sends if you have the uh, leading Islamic country in the world uh, making peace with, uh, with Israel, I think that truly is transformative. But it's complicated, and to land all of these different pieces it's, it takes a tremendous amount of work. We're in the middle of it. Um, it's still uh, still a challenge. I don't want to predict where it's going to go, but the bottom line is, yes, it's possible. And if we can get there, it would be a huge change. This is not uh, conservative republicanism. This is stupidity. Uh, the idea that we're going to shut the government down uh, when we don't control the Senate, we don't control the White House. These people can't define a win. They don't know how to take yes for an answer. Uh, it's a clown show. You keep running lunatics, you're going to be in this position. I, I've got to say that hurts, and it hurts because that's what people said about me years ago. That was Republican Congressman Mike Lawler of New York criticizing his conference's actions regarding government funding. As of this morning, it appears a new bill to fund the government may be gaining traction among Republicans, but ultimately the Republican-controlled House and democratically controlled Senate will have to compromise on a bill to send President Biden uh, to sign to avoid a shutdown. Let's bring it right now. Republican Congressman Mike Lawler of New York. Mike, thanks so much for being with us. I, I, I really wasn't joking. Like, what you said about some of your Republican colleagues, people said about many of us back in the shutdown of, of early, I think it was 1996, but we learned very quickly there was no good end game to government shutdowns. It always blows up in Republicans' faces politically. It's always a loser, and they know that. So what's going on here? Well, that's exactly right, Joe. And, you know, yesterday we had a about three hour conference meeting, uh, basically, you know, for Seinfeld fans, Festivus, an airing of the grievances. Uh, and, you know, everybody uh, had the opportunity to have their say, including myself. And I made the point, uh, yes, I will sign a discharge petition, uh, but if given no alternative and no choice, uh, I didn't come here to shut the government down. I came here to govern. You know, Joe, I was in the permanent minority of the New York State Assembly. Uh, and yeah, I voted against budget bills and I voted against the crazy policies out of New York. But I ran to be in Congress, to be in the majority and to make a difference for my district, my state and our country. And so, as I said to my colleagues yesterday, at a minimum, we have to be able to compromise within our conference, put forth a House position, and then negotiate with the Senate. It's a pretty basic concept uh, and, and basically uh, how our government is supposed to function. Congressman, good morning. So for the layman, for, for people who don't get to sit in those rooms where you were, that caucus meeting yesterday, for example, can you explain what's going on here? Because we're hearing about defense appropriation bills and CRs and the bigger uh, uh, a fiscal budget. What exactly are the dynamics at play and why are we pushing up so close to a government shutdown? Well, we have a September 30th deadline, uh, obviously, to uh, pass appropriations and keep the government funded. In the absence of passing these appropriation bills, we need to pass a continuing resolution, which, generally speaking, keeps the spending levels flat, 
uh, remaining at, at current levels for a month or you know however long necessary so that we can pass the appropriations bills and come to an agreement. Now in the past, uh, previous Congresses, including under Nancy Pelosi, they were blowing right past the September 30th deadline. They were doing omnibus packages, you know, throwing everything into one bill. What we're trying to do is ultimately get back to regular order, pass individual appropriations bills, negotiate with the Senate, and come up with a final package. We are going to obviously, most likely, uh, barring some miracle, miss the September 30th deadline to pass all these appropriations bills. So we need a continuing resolution. And what I have said to my colleagues is, we can fight it out on top line numbers with the Senate, on policy riders with the Senate, but there's no reason to shut the government down while those negotiations are ongoing. Mm -hmm. It could take a month, it could take two months to get through the appropriations process. Ideally, yes, we would have had all these appropriations bills passed. But let's be realistic here. That hasn't happened in this place in decades. So we need to go through regular order. We need to continue to fund the government. I don't want to screw around with people's 401ks in the stock market. I don't want to have our active duty military not getting paid. We have a responsibility to make sure that the government continues to function while we are negotiating uh, through the appropriations process. And, and look, let's be clear. Voters elected a House Republican majority to serve as a check and balance, to fight it out on spending, to rein in the size and scope of government. So I believe in that. We have to do it. So, Congressman, by my count, there are 18 Republican members who were elected in districts in states that Joe Biden won. What would a government shutdown do to your own chances of getting reelected next year and to the Republicans' chances of holding on to the majority in the House? Look, I'm not too worried about my chances of re-election. Uh, we're doing the work in our district. Uh, this is a district, as you said, Biden won by 10 points. There's 70,000 more Democrats than Republicans. But I've shown up in every community. I talk to my voters. I'm very direct and blunt and explain exactly what's going on. And we're doing the work on the ground. So I'm, I'm not too worried there. What I am worried about is the impact on the American people that a shutdown would have. And, and mind you, by the way, we're not saying Saving any money if we shut down. We're just going to have to pay interest on the money uh, that we spent during that time period. So it'll end up costing the American people more uh, if we shut down. Uh, Congressman Lawler, in addition to a potential shutdown, you also are will next week have the first uh, hearing on an impeachment inquiry. I imagine this is probably not particularly popular in your district as well. How are you and the other sort of Biden Republicans, as they're referred to, uh, uh, managing um, managing the prospect of, of that kind of unpopular inquiry as well? Look. These investigations obviously started earlier this year in oversight and judiciary. Uh, they are continuing, as I have said repeatedly. We are not there yet with impeachment. There is a very high bar. Uh, it should not be political. It should not be tit for tat. Uh, and the facts and the evidence uh, will determine what, if any, steps uh, are taken after this. Uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, a lot of this is semantics. It's a continuation of the investigation. The ultimate question is whether or not uh, the facts or evidence would bear out that Joe Biden somehow financially benefited from his son's uh, deals with Russian oligarchs, Ukrainian oligarchs, Romanian business uh, folks, and the Chinese. Uh, if that's the case, obviously the facts and evidence will show that. And if it's not, then I don't see how you get anywhere near impeachment. All right, Republican Congressman Mike Lawler of New York, thank you very much you. for coming on the show this morning. We appreciate it. All right, joining us now, Democratic Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey. He is a member of the Foreign Relations and Judiciary Committee. Uh, thank you very much for being on this morning. I guess, first of all, uh, what, what do you make of this effort to investigate the president and his son, Hunter, and the impeachment inquiry as it stands now? Um, uh, Mika, I just want to say something. Uh, your last segment on the cliff on child care is probably one of the most important issues to our economy, to our children, uh, to our country right now. It's not getting as much attention. I was so happy this show 
of, of which I'm a regular listener, uh, is right on point to really highlight that. We are heading towards a fiscal cliff that will literally send uh, lots of mothers who are out there in their jobs working, unfortunately, without the ability to afford child care, will lose their jobs, will stop those earnings that's to the billions of dollars, and our children uh, will lose the kind of high-quality child care that's really necessary for their growth and their strength. So thank you for covering that. It's not getting enough tension in Washington right now. It's very frustrating to me. Uh, also frustrating to me, frankly, is to see these uh, unwarranted attacks on the most independent uh, 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 leader of the judiciary that we've had in a very long time, uh, who set up processes unlike Trump's administration, uh, where the Justice Department he thought was his personal lawyers. This is someone with extraordinary integrity and independence. Uh, yesterday, to me, was a mockery of what independent justice should be about. Senator, good morning. Let me ask you about what's happening on the other side uh, of the, the camp capital complex there in the House, and that is this effort to get a spending bill done before a government shutdown deadline, which is next Saturday, nine, di nine days from now, midnight Saturday night of next weekend. What is your sense of what's happening over there? And if they send you what they're talking about now, a continuing resolution and everything else they're discussing, what will be the reaction of the Senate? Well, I'm glad you say over there because there actually has been an incredible bipartisan progress over here. Yeah. Well, spending bills uh, voted out of committee in a bipartisan fashion, uh, and you see the kind of commitment we have to getting the government funded. Uh, on the other side, I think the majority of, of, of folk over there, from Democrats and Republicans, could get something done. But the speaker, it seems, uh, is being held hostage by a handful of people who have no justifiable reason uh, to throwing our economy. Uh, uh, into the ditch by, by not funding the government, which would cause incredible hardship and, again, a self-inflicted economic wound. And for what reason? R really, for what reason? The most profligate, irresponsible budgeting practices I've seen were under the Trump administration, and most of these characters supported that. The largest increase uh, in our debt, in, in fact, of any president, was done under the four years of Donald Trump, and they said nothing. So to say that this is somehow about fiscal responsibility is the height of hypocrisy. So, Senator, let's get back to the child tax credit uh, that you were just talking about that Mika raised. Uh, it was in effect for one year, January to December, of two, uh, two years ago. It was allowed to expire. My question to you is twofold. One, why was such an effective and efficient law allowed to expire when it turned child poverty around by a huge percentage, and what can be done to reenact it? Yeah, well, these are two separate issues, and it's all about that idea of family values, of supporting the American family, the most fundamental building block of our democracy. And, and in one year, we're going to see the destruction uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the incredible child care steps that we took during the COVID crisis and allowing to lapse uh, the child tax credit, which really helped about 85 percent of American families got a benefit. It is technically the biggest middle class tax cut we've had in a generation. And because it was a fully refundable tax credit, uh, it, it virtually cut our poverty rate in America in half, our child poverty rate, which demonstrates, reveals uh, the moral obscenity that our poverty, our child poverty in this country is not inevitable. It is a policy decision. We do not have to tolerate this level of poverty. And every dollar we spend getting a child above the poverty line saves taxpayers about $5 because children above the poverty line have less engagement with the police, have less uh, in engagement with, with uh, hospital emergency rooms. And so here is two policies that that was a taxpayer investment in the American family that produced incredible dividends for our economy, lowered government spending, kept us stronger and safer that we now have have allowed to lapse. And, and that's why I don't understand this idea of family values, the stress and the strain that American families are under right now, making ends meet, dealing with higher costs, the stress and the strain, the constant uh, cortisol in the, in the bloodstream of American families because of economic pressures. And here we just allow two things, helping people have affordable child care and helping people have a child tax credit that is a savage blow uh, to the economic well-being of our children in this country. What are our nation's priorities? Here are two proven policies that made a measurable difference that we've now just allowed to lapse.
Senator Booker, good morning. John Flamir, a thing happened yesterday that hadn't happened in a while. There was a military promotion voted upon in the Senate. The new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, was approved. A couple more votes are in line for today. But your Republican colleague, Senator Tubville, says he is showing he's not going to give up his blockade. So talk to us about what can be done now. Should Democrats, are you guys considering doing what you've done the last couple of days, taking these individual votes as, as, in, as time consuming as they will be? And it, or is there something else you could do in addition to that to pressure the senator to give this up? Well, I don't know what kind of magical thinking he has and what kind of land that we live in. Uh, but we were, as a full Senate, in uh, the skiff yesterday in a classified briefing uh, with our intelligence uh, leaders as well as our military leaders. And amidst talking about uh, urgent issues involving the war in Ukraine, you had the head of the Joint Chiefs of, uh, of Staff, you had uh, the Secretary of Defense make a strong, emotional even, I, at least I felt the emotion in the room, appeal. Uh, to the Senate and to Tommy Tuberville specifically uh, to end this lift because it is making, uh, is undermining the effectiveness of the United States uh, military. Uh, and, and so this is the, 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 again, this slow erosion of our institutional norms that don't hurt one party or the other, but hurt the institutions uh, that are the bedrock of our democracy. And here is yet another moment where it's not only eroding norms, never done before, but actually undermining the effectiveness of the United States military at a time uh, that we have crisis points around the globe, need our readiness, uh, and need folks to be focused on protecting our country. So uh, do, I, do I expect Schumer to continue to do this? Yeah, we're going to do whatever we can to make sure our nation is safe and strong. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of Republicans, I know, believe what he's doing is beyond the pale and, 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 and putting us in a more perilous position. So I have a feeling you're going to see cooperation to try to go around him. The problem is uh, that it will take an inordinate amount of time in order to do so. Uh, the right thing to do is for him to lift this hold uh, and try to litigate his issues through more uh, uh, through less destructive means. Democratic Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey, thank you. Thank you very much for being on this morning. We uh, appreciate I, it. I'm more grateful for you all in some ways. Sometimes you give me uh, <laughs> a, a needed dose of sanity in mornings when I'm, I'm walking into situations that just don't don't make sense. So thank you. Uh, well, thank, thank you very much. That's, that's very what, kind. That's much kinder than what other people have said <laughs> about us. We appreciate Thanks, it, Senator Corey. Booker. Thank you so much.